Our special guest is Yuval Aviv. He's a former major in the Israeli Army and Israeli Secret Service in Mossad. He's the author of four books. For the past 40 years, he's been the CEO of Interfor, a company that specializes in investigating cyber fraud, corporate fraud, and global terrorism. Welcome to our program. Thank you for having me. My first question is, what inspired you to join the Israeli Mossad? Well, um, first of all, you need to know that in Israel, it's mandatory that everyone has to go to the army. When, when you are 18, you join the army. And in the old days, it's also today, but in my days, um, you wanted to be in a combat unit. You wanted to be really a commando and, and, and so on. I was lucky that at that time, um, Golda Meir became the Prime Minister of Israel. And she was looking for a bodyguard and a consultant on anti-terrorism and security and joined Golda's office. Mm -hmm. um, that was the greatest time I, I, I ever had, I could say, um, being traveling with Golda around the world and, and be around her and learning a lot from her. Um, there came a time where there were certain missions that the Israeli government were undertaking. Mm -hmm. um, they were under the control of the Mossad. Yeah. And um, I automatically has jo have joined the Mossad to be able to lead one of those units uh, in one of those big operations. Yeah. Yuval, following the massacre of the Israeli athletes uh, during the Munich Games in Olympic Games in 1972, you were tasked uh, with the um, effort to bring these terrorists to justice. Right. Uh, at that time, there was not uh, CTV, there was very little airport surveillance, uh, no cell phones, no text messaging. Can you give us an idea of how you were able to track down these terrorists? Um, it all started when the event happened, the unfortunate event happened. Golda Meir made a very big decision at the time, which no other leader has made since, to find those 11 terrorists who masterminded it and participated in it and bring them to justice. The idea was, we're going to find them. It will send a message to terrorists wherever you are. For the rest of your life, you have always to look back behind your back because we are coming and we're going to find you and bring you to justice mm -hmm. for as long as it takes. Um, those 11 terrorists were hiding in Europe. They thought that it's safer to be in Europe than in any of the Middle Eastern country, which is where the army can go in, do raids and bring them back. Mm -hmm. um, Golda came up with an idea. We're going to put together a team of five commando agents who would go undercover in Europe, penetrate some of the, the terrorist networks of the day, and in the hope they come across those guys and bring them to justice. It was never done before. It was an experimental uh, type of event. And it was Friday afternoon in Golda's office when she came up with this idea. And she turned around and said, and Chival, you're going to lead the team of five. Um, it took four and a half years, four and a half years away from our life. Five guys in a safe house in Europe. Everything that we know of as cell phones, all the computers, database, didn't exist in those days. Um, you had to develop information. You have to find sources and find the whereabouts. You had to buy your own weapons. You had to generate your own unmarked ammunition. You have to get explosive. You were a team on your own. One by one, we found 10 out of the 11 and brought them to justice. But unfortunately, I also lost three members of my team. Reportedly, you warned the US authorities that there would be a terrorist attack on US soil. Apparently, they did, they did not heed your advice. Why was this? And were you to give them the same advice today, do you think they would have listened to you? Unfortunately, um, you know, the information that I mentioned was there will be a hijacking of planes. Mm -hmm. They will be used for 
as flying bombs into targets, but we didn't know where the targets are. But the information was the terrorists are already in the country and they're ready to do it. In your opinion, how effective is airport security now? We're, we're light years of being really secured. The reason is that we don't have the right budgets. Um, the agents in the airports are not trained or the training is minimal. If I compare what we do in Israel, the Israeli airline El Al, how secure they are, um, and the techniques that we are using and the, everything that we are, have developed through the year. If the American authorities, airport authorities, would invite the Israeli government and say, hey, you invented those system, systems. You have perfected it. You, have, you are the state of the art. Come and, uh, and teach us. Yes. The answer is no. Hasn't happened? No. Corporate fraud and cyber fraud are on the increase. Can you give us some idea of how you track the monies associated with these frauds? I started 40 years ago um, to investigate fraud in general. It used to be small companies, private owned companies. The owner of the company knew well in advance that his company is not going to do well, it's going to go under. Mm -hmm. So it's human nature. He dipped into the funds, took assets, put it offshore somewhere in the hope that he'll get away with that and then he's retired. So all the cases that I worked on 40 years ago were in a three to five million dollars per case. And I said then, why well, people steal five million and a lot of them got away with it. Mm -hmm. 15 years later, all the cases that I worked on were in the hundreds of millions per case. People just got greedier and said, hey, if I do it, let me do it big. In the last 10 or 12 years, all the cases I'm working on are in the billions per case. How do we do it? I always say that there must be a school of fraud somewhere that they all go to <laughs> because they all do the same stupid <laughs> mistakes and we have read the book and we know how to go about it. Today I can tell you, you cannot hide money. There's no way you can move big amount of money and hide it without professionals like myself and some others who can trace it, freeze it and bring it home. The key of those investigations is follow the money. How did it start? Where did it go? And of course, monitoring closely the people who stole the money. Uh, but on a weekly basis, they call the banks. How is my money doing? Because they want to make sure that it's still there. Yeah. Um, are most of these uh, cyber attacks and cyber crimes uh, state-sponsored or are the individual hackers uh, out for gain themselves? Um, it started as really young kids in colleges who had access to computers try to do all kind of mischief. Yeah. Uh, they can send an, uh, an invoice to uh, Coca-Cola to ship, uh, um, you know, load, uh, a truckload of uh, Coca-Cola to the campus. Right. Then some smarter people said, we can make money out of it. We can really go into your account, my account, mm -hmm. in banks, and take money out of it. Then governments woke up and say, mm -hmm. I don't have to cross the border with tanks, with weapons, and yeah. so on. I can use computers, and I can cause havoc in countries that I want to do it. Mm -hmm. And one of the big examples that we see now, it's in America. The Russians have managed to infiltrate our election. So what can uh, corporations and governments do to prevent these types of attacks? A, you need to develop, of course, counter systems mm -hmm. to um, A, raise the flags when it happens, um, and then be tough in enforcing it. Mm -hmm. um, the biggest offenders right now are countries. You have China, 
Uh, you have Russia. You have some countries who sponsor those type of activities. Iran. Iran, very big. Mm -hmm. And I recently came from a trip in China. Um, the Chinese government has created villages where young kids in the age of 15, 16 are being recruited. They're there in that secluded village for 15 years. They don't go home. They're being trained to be hackers. They're being supplied with the best computers, the fastest computers, and their job is to do two things. Find sophisticated hacks, but also develop viruses that now you do not have to, again, um, cross borders with weapons and so on. With a push of a button, you can shut the electricity in, in, in half of Europe. Um, you, can, you can contaminate the water supply, the food supply. Those are the kind of things. The latest one, which we now know for sure that the Chinese have developed, they have a virus that, with a push of a button, will shut down all the GPS satellite in orbit. This is a major problem. I mean, oh, it's a, it's, a, it's a major, and it will be growing. As fraud is growing, that will grow. So in a developing country like the Bahamas, do you think we're open to cyber attacks? Oh, I'm sure that it's, first of all, the Chinese are here. Mm -hmm. They already have come in, mm -hmm. they're building here, they're spending money here, and so on. They've studied the Bahamas. Mm -hmm. They know exactly where are the weak points, and they're going to cash on that in due time. So absolutely, there's no country in the world that is immune against it. Mm -hmm. If America is not immune, if America cannot deal with that type of cyber mm -hmm. attacks, Bahamas has no chance. Yes. So their policy of one road, one belt, is part and policy of exactly. this whole expansion of cyber terrorism and exactly. cyber fraud. Exactly. Mm -hmm. um, you know, recently in the Bahamas, uh, the Royal Bank of Canada ATM network was, was hacked. Uh, so what can uh, we do as individuals to protect uh, ourselves from credit card and debit card uh, fraud and hacking? You need to assume that the minute you fill up an application for a credit card, for a loan, anything where you put your personal data into it and able to get a credit card, mm -hmm. you are open for an attack. Mm -hmm. So if I were a hacker, I'm not going to work hard to go after you individually and the other guy individually. I will go to the center where there are thousands of credit cards. And who has those centers? A bank, a credit card. Mm -hmm. Um, and lately, they go into department stores that sell uh, merchandise, and they can get a few hundred thousand credit cards in one shot, all the data behind it. And they go and max those cards immediately. You know, to be really honest, there's almost no defense of it. The only thing that you need to do is to really monitor on an ongoing basis your credit. Our students and even adults give away far too much information online. Do you think that they should give less information? And if they do give information, how can they protect themselves? Well, only if you really need You know, young people today use all those social services um, that um, open themselves up. You know, mm -hmm. hackers, the way hackers go into even a big company, yes. they're going to go into your emails first. They're going to go into your social um, uh, networks, and through that, they're going to get into, into the main computers. Yes. So if you don't need to travel with a laptop, keep it at home. Um, you know, those are where the vulnerabilities are. There is a conference of hackers every year in Amsterdam during the summer. Mm -hmm. Every summer, half a million young kids who are hackers and want to be hackers meet for a conference. And they exchange ideas and so on. And you know, if you're not a computer person, you don't understand a word they're saying. Yes. So I choose a young kid, 21 year old, who is supposed to be a hacker, a big hacker. And I said, okay, 
come with me to New York and to our headquarters in New York, introduce to our team and, and you know, be available as a consultant. Good. I'm flying back with him from Amsterdam to New York. I'm sitting on a plane with him and um, he sits next to me and after takeoff, like everyone else in the plane, he takes his laptop out and he says, boss, pick up any laptop here on the plane and I want to show you something. I said, don't do anything while you're sitting next to me. Are you crazy? What are you doing? Said, no, no, I want to show you something. I said, there's a guy in 2C in the front who's sitting there and working hard on the computer. He says, one moment. He started hacking on his computer and I see the guy suddenly looking back. He was all shook up and I said to him, what did you do? He says, I sent him a message. You're working on a document and you have spelling mistake. Do you want me to correct it to you? <laughs> I said, no, I don't believe it. He said, no, one moment. Boom, 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 boom. The document came into his computer. Wow. It's a lawyer who worked on a draft. Yes, yes. He told me, I can do it to any computer here on the plane. The moral behind it is that today, mm -hmm. the technology is such that the average person, even those who think that they're great on computers, mm -hmm. they're light years away from understanding what hackers can do, yes. the capabilities that are out there. In your employee, you have uh, many accountants. Yes. I think over 45 accountants. Yes. Uh, lawyers. Yes. Uh, private investigators. Yes. We're all specialists in fraud. All fraud and white collar crime fraud. Correct. So do you think that maybe the students at the University of the Bahamas yeah. should think about pursuing careers in fraud? This is the future. Mm -hmm. Fraud is growing dramatically. Um, a lot of the accountants now are looking in to get into forensic accounting mm -hmm. because this is more exciting than just doing tax returns. Um, and it's getting so sophisticated every month that you need, you need new people. You need young people yes. to get into it. And my last question for you is more of a general question. For years, there's been conflict in the Middle East between Israel and some of the Arab countries. Yeah. Uh, using your experience of living in Israel and living abroad, what measures do you think can be taken to try and bring some type of sustainable peace to the area? The problem in the Middle East is that there is no economical future for young kids. If you go to uh, the West Bank, you go to Gaza, you go to, there's no running water, there's no schools, there's mm -hmm. no, they are, and there's a lot of young kids who are on the street have no future in a way. Mm -hmm. Unless there is an economical solution where you bring everybody to the 21st century, there will never be peace. Mm -hmm. Because you can see, when you fly over the certain areas, you see Israel, green uh, trees, um, and th then you just look behind the border, it's desert, camels, and things like that. And of course, that they're looking aside and they're jealous. I mean, it's human nature. Mm -hmm. I want what you have. Mm -hmm. And if I can't get it, I will find a way to get it. Mm -hmm. So unless there is a dialogue where, but I, I can tell you, I, I have to be pessimistic, unfortunately, there's no money available for such a thing. Mm -hmm. Countries are not gonna invest money in just bringing people to the 21st century. If there's no oil there, if there's no um, you know, gold or silver to be dug, they're not, they're not interested. Mm -hmm. And I don't see, I really don't see where a future right now. So really the only answer is for those countries to develop their own human capital they have and to. develop their own economies. Yeah. And one of the ways to do it is kill corruption, mm -hmm. government corruption, um, that is the biggest thing. I mean, you know, the poorer the country is, the more corruption is there. You want, you want to get loans from the, uh, from the international uh, financial, mm -hmm. you, you need to clean up. Mm -hmm. You need to make sure that, the, that there's no corruption. Mm -hmm. We educate um, the police, the intelligence, um, uh, the courts, the prosecutors, how to go about 
transparency. Mm -hmm. How to bring the country, and it's a money maker, because mm -hmm. we go after the people that stole money, that embezzled money, mm -hmm. and live maybe somewhere else, and we find them, and we bring them back, and the money back. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's really what we do, very successfully. Y Yuval, it's been an honor and a pleasure meeting you here today. You've given us a lot to think about. And thank God that the people like you are around trying to make this world a safer place. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you, our viewers, for tuning in to our first episode of Connecting the Dots. I'm your host, Dr. John Rogers.